I really appreciate everybody coming out here tonight. I know your time is very valuable. I respect your time, and thank you for investing an hour with us. I really, I really, really appreciate it. I hope I can make it worth your while. So um, what I thought I would do is, is uh, go through some important topics tonight, but just spend about half of the time doing that, and then we'll spend half of the time just opening it up for questions and answers, because I think that's the most valuable part of an interaction like this. But I, I want to start and talk about <clears throat> three topics that have been very, very important to me and changed the way I practice medicine. And that is the opioid epidemic, the Swift Path Enhanced or Rapid Recovery Program, and working at Coordinated Health, which is a physician owned hospital, which I will explain. Those three things have come together to create a system that has produced unbelievable outcomes, unbelievable patient experiences in this system. We get high quality outcomes at the lowest cost in the safest environment. So I'm going to tell you how that has all come together. First, I'm going to backtrack a little bit and talk about how when we were in medical school, I don't think that um, we had two or three lectures in pharmacology on narcotic medication or anti-inflammatories. And that's when Dr. Nicholson went to school, which was way before me, and uh, Nick Slenker a, a few years after me. And really, all we learned about narcotics was on our clinical rotations. And you know who we learned from? We learned from our senior residents. We just mentored from them, and we saw what they did with their patients. And when you're in the surgical track, we hurt a lot of people with surgery. And after we hurt them, they wake up from anesthesia. And then you know what we did? We just gave them narcotics. And really, the only thing that we were required to know about narcotics was something called narcotic equivalence. And we used to memorize the morphine equivalent. So if we use different narcotics like Dilaudid or Demerol, we had to know how did that correlate to the morphine equivalents or oxycodone or hydrocodone? And really, it worked wonderful. It helped with pain. But then, of course, the attending physician went home, and us as the medical students or the residents were up all night getting the calls that the patient is sick to their stomach. They're vomiting. They can't urinate. They need a catheter. You know, the next day, they have an ileus. They need an NG tube. Those are just some of the 24 complications that you see you know, on the, so on the, um, on the right-hand side. And what we didn't know is all these complications in the hospital, about 60% of hospital-related complications can be related to opioid-related adverse effects. And it's worse the older you get, the more comorbidities in the overweight population or the patients with pulmonary problems. So two years ago, I was not aware of the relationship between this heroin epidemic that we see in the paper and the prescription opioid connection or the physician relationship to it. I really didn't realize that we were a major contributing factor to that. This prompted a seminar that we gave this summer. I don't know if any, any of you attended that at Parkland High School. Did anybody go to that? By chance, good. So I don't want to repeat myself. But anyway, Dr. Slanker, Dr. Bruce Nicholson, we had congressmen, we had state senators there, we had law enforcement, we had addiction counselors. It was absolutely a wonderful, wonderful seminar that we put on. It's online. I'm not going to go over all the aspects of that, but you can look at it on the Coordinated Health website or ssptv.com. But what we found is that there were five Ps, what I call the root cause of this opioid crisis. I'm only going to talk about the one P, and that's ours, the physician component. And if you're part of that problem, you better become part of the solution. That's what this is all about. We sort of became, at least in our own little space, part of that solution. So we've figured out in one of the most painful operations, orthopedic operations, how to do this with no or minimal narcotics. It's absolutely amazing. I was speaking to one of these gentlemen on the elevator coming up, and for three decades, why we didn't figure this out sooner. Um, 
Some interesting facts is that more people abuse prescription drugs in the United States than all the other bad drugs combined, cocaine, heroin, hallucinogenic drugs. Each day, almost 50 people die from overdose of prescription painkillers. And drug overdose is the leading cause of accidental de death exceeding uh, motorcycle and car accidents, which is absolutely amazing. And the headlines on the heroin epidemic are out there, but opioid deaths exceed that by a factor of two to one. We're getting numb to see the latest celebrity in the paper die <clears throat> of a narcotic overdose. This happened to be fentanyl that our anesthesia colleagues use in the operating room every day. And you know what I didn't know? I would have never guessed that one of the narcotics we use on our patients is 50 times more potent than heroin. It's absolutely amazing. And in this particular celebrity, um, he attributed to orthopedic issues. He took pain medicine, something 50 times more potent than heroin for his chronic, for his chronic pain, his chronic hip and knee pain. Other facts are that in the older generation, chronic pain, not acute pain, occurs in more, to, in more than 40, 40% 40 of that population. And ironically, ironically now, the diagnosis of chronic pain is one of those diagnoses that medical cannabis has been approved for in Pennsylvania. So you'll see a lot of snickering in the older groups where they think this maybe came from the 60s. But let me tell you, when you look at the evidence, and, I, and Bruce Nicholson actually did a lot of research. He's the head of pain management at Lehigh Valley. And uh, he uh, was the major consultant for the governor on this bill, which was passed almost a year ago. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in a bit. Um, and I'll tell you why that may be um, a significant contributor to our pain management armamentarium in the future. Opioid analgesics are the most common prescribed class of drug in America. It's absolutely amazing. And it's great for acute pain. It, it's wonderful if you need it. If you're on the battlefield, right, they use morphine on the battlefield. But these drugs are a thousand times more potent than those drugs that they have on the battlefield. But how many people are on it for chronic pain that we see in the office? And the data for chronic pain is very, very questionable. There's not a lot of strong data that opioids are good. And there actually is some data that if you're on narcotics for chronic pain, your pain could actually worsen in the long run and, and cause other um, neurogenic type of pains. Among 12th graders, if you think um, they don't know there's a medication in the medicine box at home, think again. Six of their top 10 choices for substance abuse are prescription drugs. This article I took from the Wall Street Journal this week. Um, and a deadly opioid, another one is out there called carfentanil. It's responsible for 700 deaths in the Midwest and in Florida. And I couldn't believe that fentanyl was 50 times more potent than heroin. This drug is 100 times more potent than fentanyl. Look at the toxicity. Look at the strength and the danger of these drugs that are out there. That's 10,000 times as potent as morphine, which is the drug that you see in all the, you know, the World War II movies when somebody's dying on the field. And these medications are out there. They're strong, but they're killers. And so we say, OK, let's try to limit or get rid of opioids. But we can't go back in time to this picture of, profession, uh, you know, of um, Samuel Gross doing ancient surgery. You can't go cold turkey and just stop narcotics, which worked for acute pain. We had to come up with an alternative game plan. So in our armamentarium, in our toolbox, we have a whole bunch of medications out there, including acetaminophen or Tylenol, nonsteroidals, Advil, ibuprofen, gabapentinoids, Lyrica, Neurontin, COX-2, Celebrex, steroids, aspirin, omega-3s, even for their anti-inflammatory and pain relieving factors, you know, rest, ice, elevation, all those sorts of things. Now the American Society of Anesthesiologists recommends acetaminophen, nonsteroidals, and gabapentin or Lyrica on every single surgical patient, unless there's a contraindication, according to your surgeon. So I mean anything that you have, ENT surgery, oral surgery, hernia surgery. But probably, so our, anesthesi our anesthesiology colleagues are ahead of the game, I think, in this. 
And why, why are they recommending that? Because the anesthesiologists are the ones in the recovery room that get called and they have to give narcotics. But these multimodal approaches um, help eliminate or lessen the need for narcotics. So all these tools are in our toolbox, but how do you use them? You just can't say, well, geez, we have all these medications. We have to figure out how to use them. And if you look at this complicated picture, when there is a, a pain stimulus, injury, or let's say a surgical incision, that signal, that signal gets transmitted up the, up the neural pathways from the skin into the afferent nerves, into the spinal cord, up to the brain, and then back down. So at each level, that signal can be changed or modulated. And I put this cool picture up there because I, I, I understand things simply. Think of that signal as the water going through the hose. And if you step on it, that's modulating that signal with one medication. Now we have two, three, four, five different medications and some other modalities. So by the time that signal gets to the end of the hose, it's just dripping out there. It's not pouring out needing narcotics. So if it's a drip, 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 you hardly need any narcotics. That's kind of a good analogy of how multimodal pain medicine works at different layers. Are, you know, we load patients ahead of time with non-steroidals, simple things like Tylenol, and you'll say, geez, that never works. It's absolutely amazing when you use these things in combination. The gabapentinoids, the Lyrica, the Neurontins work in the spinal cord. The um, opioids work. Uh, in the brain, and there are some receptors where it crosses over, but the cannabinoids work in the brain. There's amazing receptors in the brain. A lot of you may have heard about marijuana is one of those things, medical cannabis for cancer patients that are terribly, terribly sick on chemotherapy, and it can't be controlled by anything else except medical cannabis, and it helps with seizures. So when you look at the basic science, and maybe Bruce can speak to this a little, a little later, has unbelievable tissue healing qualities. These are, these are all the basic science things. And you know how we just talked about the opioids and the 50 deaths a day that are occurring and it, it kills more people than car accidents? Do you know how many fatalities have been measured from cannabis toxicity in the emergency room? None. You don't die from it. So, you know, we all sort of had the 60th, the 60th issue or, or a perception of it, but it's a whole different ball game when we look at these chemicals. So we're excited as we look at eliminating some of these um, deadly narcotics and adding possibly something else. And it may take a while, even though it's uh, approved in the state before that becomes um, available as a medicinal use. But anyway, stay tuned. And when our major networks and um, medical consultants on the cable news networks you know, do a 180 about face and say it's really time for a revolution here. It's really based, uh, you know, on the science component to it. So, you know, if we have a lot of questions about that, that's why I brought Bruce in, because I bring it up, but it's really controversial, and I don't want to answer any of those questions, so I'll let Bruce answer them. The final modulation occurs at the brain. So besides stepping on the hose with medication, it's all about the per how perception of pain is altered. And our pain is altered by our previously conditioned experience and cues. Oh my God, this is, this is so painful. My neighbor had it. It's going to be worth it, but it's, it's going to be the most terrible experience that you had. I had my other knee done 10 years ago. That's terrible. I mean, it's a good knee, but it's terrible for the pain postoperatively. I'm going to get through it. They go in the hospital. The nurses go, it's going to be painful. Take pain to keep ahead of the pain. So here's the narcotics. You're going to therapy. Here, take some narcotics before you go to therapy because it's going to be. We got rid of all that. This is crazy. This doesn't happen. So, but we have to program the people, and Melissa does a great job of doing that in our joint camp, which is why we don't let them go to the normal joint experience, you know, at a hospital that has 20 orthopedic surgeons and they have this generic lecture. So you can program people. They say, how much is this going to hurt? And I say, well, how much do you want it to hurt? So you can program yourself. But honestly, I'll show you that uh, it's absolutely amazing to think that you could get up, walk around, have breakfast, have no pain after knee replacement. Now, it's not magic. I mean, this thing, you know, there, it's still real surgery, but it's a lot less than it used to be. But every step of the way, we reprogram our patients. Therapy shouldn't hurt. You don't have tears running down your face. If therapy hurts, it's wrong. And so that's our approach to this. So our whole re-education and reprogramming people 
is important. So now we have this toolbox of new medications. We know where they work. We know when to give them. And now we have a package. We give before surgery. We give the day of surgery. We give intraoperatively. We give on the way home and for the next two weeks. And if you look in red, we only have narcotics. Now, we're not mean, but we don't give 100 of these painful things to sit in the cupboard and use 10 of them, and then 90 are there being diverted. So it's only for breakthrough pain. And I mean, I have, again, Bobby Chomick over here, two knee replacements done a couple months apart, zero narcotics, no pills. And I think Bud and Aaron had very painful drilling holes and big saws in their knee and stuff. And literally, hardly any pain after surgery. The next day, maybe one or two narcotic pills. This was unheard of. And uh, you, you can ask them you know, when we're done here. So then the Swift Path program, I didn't want to recreate the wheel. So we have this new pain program. Why do you have to be in the hospital? You know, and again, for 20 years, I did partial knee replacements. But a colleague of mine has been working on this for 10 years. And you have to put this whole program together of how do we get patients out of the hospital? I think we have a wonderful hospital. But stay the hell out of it as quick as you can. You know why? Because bad things happen in hospitals. It's the third leading cause of death after cancer and heart disease. It's wonderful if you need a liver transplant, if you're in a motorcycle accident, you need these big hospitals. But a lot of what we do is going to transition. You don't need to have healthy people with a bad elbow, shoulder, ankle, or knee in a big hospital that has, has higher infection rates for this type of surgery. So, but you have to re-educate people. You have to have the right patient selection. You have to have all the safety protocols. And you have to pick the right hospital for them because there are people that are very sick that need tertiary level hospitals. You have to pick the right length of stay. Our length of stay for a total knee arthroplasty right now is less than one day. It's less than one day because that's an average. About 40% of our patients are done the same day and go home. The majority of them go home that are there the next day. And then you still have a few people that because of social situations, medical conditions, have to go to, have to, go to rehab. And total joints are going through the roof. The baby boomers have uh, assured us that it's going to increase to you know, 700% in the next 15 years. But we can't afford the way we do it now. It's too expensive. An Allentonian and a good friend of, uh, of uh, mine is now the CEO at Jefferson, Steve Clasco. He's the head of one of these biggest traditional hospitals. And he says the healthcare system is broke. It's been broke for 30 years years. It's inefficient, it's expensive, it's inequitable, and it's unsafe. It's unsafe. It has to change. And the resistance to change is because we've just do the same things over and over again. And frankly, we need less beds. Hospital beds have gone down, admissions have gone down, outpatient procedures have gone up. But what do we see around here? I call it the hospital wars. It's the hospital wars. You see one building go up, then another building goes up with the other logo on it, you know? And then another hospital gets bought up north. They buy another one or build one next to it. We don't need all these beds. And they do. You're just sort of, you know, it's like, it's like if, you're, if you can't swim correctly, you know, and you reproduce the same bad stroke, you will just swim terribly. And so if you have the old traditional way of doing things, you just keep doing it. It's not going to change. So one of the things we're trying to do, you know, is to change that. And uh, you know, Craig McAllister, a friend of mine who started Swift Path, said that ha ha right now half of all the total joints are going to be done under 65. So we have a healthier cohort of people that are wearing out sooner that don't necessarily need the traditional way. But we also have you know, our 65 to 90-year-old patients that have had some issues with their heart or lungs. Or, and they need, need you know, um, higher acuity hospitals. But outpatient joint replacement methods and transitioning these to ambulatory centers offers one of the most powerful, rewarding, effective solutions for patients and physicians. Now, here's the number across the country last year. This is a predictive analytical company that's used by all the hospitals, the ambulatory surgical units, the medical device companies. There was 166,000 outpatient total knees and hips done last year. Three quarters of them are knees. So, you know, it's a big number, 120,000, but there's about 800,000 knees done last year. So maybe that's 15%. Do you know how many were done in the Lehigh Valley? Only here at Coordinated Health. 
And so we've done up to 250. So we know where the trend is going, but you can't do them in some of the older traditional methods. So if you're a skeptic of outpatient total joint arthroplasty, here's what I say, buckle up. And um, this was yesterday. This is an hour after a joint replacement. Her husband can't believe that she's walking. She doesn't want to use the walker, get rid of this thing. I've asked her if she has any pain. She's got no pain. She's going home. And so that's an hour after a joint replacement. I mean, she's in her normal clothes. She's not in her pajamas with her behind hanging out, you know. So, you know, so, you know, what's causing this shift? So a couple things. Minimally invasive surgery. Minimally invasive surgery isn't the size of the incision. It's how we treat the tissues. We minimize or don't use tourniquets anymore. We don't dislocate kneecaps. We don't dislocate the knee. We don't, we don't cut tendons. So a lot of the tissue is treated more gently. Enhanced pain control, we talked about that. Um, and, and the patient experience. I mean, they want, they want their, you know, their own room if they're staying overnight. They want their care partner to stay with them. And they want the best quality with lower costs. We educate patients. We want to avoid complications. We, we have the same team every day that does the same procedure. And you can't do the same surgery as an inpatient as an outpatient. You have to learn these techniques. Um, we have cloud-based follow-up. We have 24-7 um, availability. Um, we want to avoid readmissions. We have care on demand. So these are all important aspects of a successful program. And by 2026, look at this estimate. And these are these are consultant groups that pay for this data. 51% of all joint replacements will be done as an outpatient. I put coordinated health. Right now we're doing, on our service, 35 to 40% outpatient. So we're about five years ahead of the mean, but we've put a lot of work into that. So we've been you know, working on this for the past three years. Now the final, the final leg of this stool is why choose a physician-owned hospital? And it's simple. It's quality and value. And our legal team was a little nervous about me talking about this, saying, I, you know, I, I don't want you up there, Tom, maybe saying all this. I said, it's not me. I'll put the references. This all comes from peer-reviewed journals that talk about physician ownership of hospitals is not a new concept. You know, some of the best hospitals in the country are physician-owned. Mayo Clinic is physician-owned hospital. It grew out of necessity, not popularity. It's because medical care was no longer being dominated by those actually taking care of patients. It was being dominated by administrators, bureaucrats, medical management entities that no longer had sight of the real goal. So physician ownership has put back the care where it belongs with doctors and their patients. And, and I think you see that with the patient to nurse ratio. So it's simple. Um, quality and value. Consumer report says you get higher quality, better efficiency at physician-owned hospitals. They are the most cost-effective, efficient hospitals in the U.S. How many are there? There's 200 out of 6,000. There's not very many. Not very many. And, and they receive no tax dollars. So you really, really have to watch the bottom line. You don't find excess administrative costs. You don't find unnecessary medical equipment, but the data is overwhelming. Better quality, less expensive, patient-centric care. But there's a law that a few people know cause, uh, called Section 6001 in the Affordable Care Act that prohibits any expansion. So those 200 hospitals, they're there. They can't enter the hospital wars. They can't expand. They can't grow. And frankly, you might want less of the, the more expensive ones and more of these that provide higher care at lower cost. But what happened is the hospital lobby said, if you can't beat them, lobby Congress to eliminate the competition. And that's what went into the Affordable Care Act. So we're hoping with the repeal, some of the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, that um, Representative Sam Johnson from Texas put in the fact that they're trying to get that hospital moratorium um, exclude it. So Becker's Hospital Review looked at the top 60 hospitals in the country. Almost 40 of them were physician-owned hospitals. The government data, the CMS data itself demonstrates that physician-owned hospitals are leading centers of excellence, top performing, most affordable nationwide 
and they shouldn't be targeted for extinction. So, you know, I'm just a little defensive. So I just wanted to explain that. We, physician-owned hospitals don't do all things for all people, but if you look at those hospitals that focus in their own space, they do it better, cheaper, with better outcomes. And again, you know, that's coordinated health list of patient awards, five-star medical awards, um, et cetera. So that's really, really the end of my formal presentation.